name is Georgia, and I'm going to be emceeing and hosting tonight. But um, most importantly, we have four wonderful speakers who are going to talk to you about the queer history of Wellington um, and lots of surrounding subjects around that. So first of all, I have to do the boring health and safety stuff. Let me get my sheet of paper. So, evacuation to the left and right ground doors. So that way and that way. Um, and the main point is on Featherston Street. Yeah, Featherston Street. So if there's a fire alarm or anything like that, I just head out the doors that way or that way and meet on Featherston Street. Um, the toilets are to my left, around here, so if you need to, get up and go, that's totally fine. Um, also, make sure that if you didn't scan in on the QR code on your way in, please do so on the way out. Or even if you don't want to scan with the QR code, um, you can just put it in manually in the app. So either way, make sure that the government knows where you are at all times. <laughs> um, so the event tonight is basically uh, an exploration of the queer history of Wellington. And it's going to be really good as part of a series of five events that we've got going on um, here at the council. Um, so this is in the libraries and I come from archives, the city council, and we've got lots of stuff going on there on our social media too. So you can check that out. <laughs> um, so a bit about me, um, as you can tell, I'm not from Raleigh Parks. I am from Scotland originally, I came here three years ago and uh, they haven't been able to chuck me out yet, so I'm still here. Um, I came here to study, so I started at Massey um, researching Tom Hardy's and female identity. So that's what my research is in. My previous life was an archaeologist, so a bit of a um, bit of time, but I'm here now anyway, working at archives, having just finished my postdoc. So that's why I'm here. Um, I have found oh, a really wonderful community in Wellington, which was really Great to find because I missed my morning class, so it's great to be here. Um, now, we have some really fantastic speakers tonight. We've got uh, Will Hansen, who is a PhD student, about to be a PhD student, okay. um, and we also have Roger Swanson, who is a happily retired archivist and librarian. <laughs> um, we have Kayla Rian, um, and she's going to be talking to us about um, her time in Wellington and with her uh, group, to find one. <laughs> and we also, uh, last but not least, have Mani, and Mani is an intersex exchange agent, counsellor, educator, and mediator, and they are going to be talking to us about um, their life and about their experiences in Wellington and what they do too. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to let Will come up and give us It's nice to see everyone. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to us talk. Um, it's really weird to be up on stage uh, with these three because all of these three have been mentors to me at some point over the last few years. Well, they're all currently mentors to me, and I feel a bit soppy about it and a bit weird about it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to listen to the three of them speak. Um, yeah, those who don't know me, my name's Will. Um, it's also a pleasure to be invited here because I used to work here. Like, a month ago. Hey everyone! <laughs> Thank you, Lavana, for organizing it. I think you've done a really great job. Okay, so enough about me. Um, oh, actually, no, I should say one thing. Um, so, yeah, I'm about to start my PhD, but also I'm a member of the Lesbian and Gay Archives, Tipurana Takatakwe or Aotearoa. Um, and as part of that, um, please go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, I've been organizing um, the Archive is Alive zine series. So a couple of people here are involved with that, which was really cool. Uh, so basically, we've got a whole bunch. This is the second one we've done. This one was specifically trans-focused. And for this one, we got a whole bunch of trans people into the archives, looking at the archives, and then um, day two was making zines, and this all happened over the weekend. So you're getting a sneak preview of the cover on the side there, um, and you should all come to the launch, which is on Tuesday the 30th of March at 5.30pm at the National Library, which is the one down by Parliament Building. So that'll be really fun. Um, so yeah, that's enough about me. Um, for the History of Wellington stuff, I decided to do like a potted trans history of Wellington because I don't have too much time, so I just wanted to highlight a few um, cool events and people uh, from, our, from our history, or from our trans history. So, 
1911, on the eve of the First World War, Dr. Helmer von Denneville arrived in Wellington. Um, my friend and archivist Jared Davidson did a huge amount of work uncovering Helmar's story, so I have him to thank for all of the info I'm about to share with you on Helmar. Um, and you should all go and buy his awesome book, which is called Dead Letters and Is There Any Good Books Will Meet You? <laughs> In Jared's book, he publishes excerpts from letters that were written by women to Helmar. Um, I'm going to read one of them out now. So this is from Helene to Helmar in May 1917. Oh my Helma, I do want you so. I must let my heart's love flow out to you in writing. It will relieve me. All today you have been more than usually in my mind, and life without you is difficult. How I long to go to you. Perhaps tonight you may be thinking of me. You may be near me in the spirit, as I believe you often are, or I could not at other times feel so content, so happy, so secure in the possession of that treasure. But tonight, Though I am fighting against the boredom of everything, I feel so restless, so aching for a sight of you. Are you tired this weekend? Are you longing for the great blue expanses of the ocean, for the illimitable distances of the desert? Would that I could give you your heart's desire, whatever it may be. So that beautiful letter is one of very many that Helmar received from various women um, throughout their time in Wellington. Uh, so whatever else about Helmar that we know, we know they were absolutely a stud. Helma <laughs> was assigned female at birth but dressed in men's clothing and was treated highly suspiciously by the police for it. It didn't help that the First World War was raging on and their Danish accent, uh, in combination with their gender nonconformity, made them the perfect target for anti-German hysteria. A police report in 1916 described a disturbing incident at the Lahman Health Home in Miramar where Helma worked as a doctor. A disgruntled vicar named Edward Bond claimed that his wife, Mary, had been lured away by Helma. Suffering from a severe nervous breakdown, Mary had moved to the home that Helma worked at on her doctor's advice in 1915. But eight months later, she no longer wanted anything to do with her husband, and whenever he visited, Mary refused to see him. How outrageous! Here was evidence of a masculine, cross-dressing woman meddling with a man's wife and shamelessly subverting gender norms. Not only that, but Helma was a suspected enemy alien. Um, Sir John Selman, author of The War Regulations, wrote, there is grave ground for suspicion that this person is a mischievous and dangerous imposter. Someone who ought, in the public interest, to be imprisoned during the war. Her identity is wholly mysterious. Salman was unsure whether or not um, Helma was a man or a woman, um, and because of this, um, I, I tried to imprison them. But because Helma always treated their patients so kindly and so effectively and had so many lady admirers, Whenever the police tried to pressure their patients into giving uh, statements against them, uh, patients would refuse to say anything condemning. So the police decided, despite all that, that Helma um, would be treated as guilty until proven innocent. Um, so they were imprisoned in Matu Songs Island uh, in 1917. Uh, after their imprisonment, they moved to San Francisco with Helene, the woman who wrote the letter, um, and they successfully fought for the right to wear men's clothing in public while they were there. So they went on to have a pretty good life on the sea. Um, jumping forward a few decades, I wanted to, we can't talk about Wellington's trans history without talking about Carmen. Carmen was a sex worker, a performer, a businesswoman, a matriarch, an outspoken personality, an activist, and a one-time mayoral candidate. And Kayla's probably going to talk a bit more about Carmen later, so um, I won't say an awful lot, but it's just really important to know that she was a huge celebrity in Wellington. Everyone knew her. She had swam down the streets and all her jewelry and her flowers and her confidence. And she owned so many businesses on Cuba Street that it was referred to as Carmen's Downtown. And that's why today the pedestrian lights on Cuba Street are shaped in her image. Uh, Carmen's Coffee Lounge was pretty special too. Uh, we don't really have coffee lounges so much these, these days, but um, back in the 70s, uh, they were venues that would provide like a place to go once the places that sold alcohol stopped selling alcohol and a lot of them would sneakily slip alcohol into your drinks if you asked them to. <laughs> so like the other coffee lounges, Carmen's Coffee Lounge did that, um, but it was also pretty special because there were some bedrooms upstairs which operated as a brothel. Uh, customers would request what kind of sex they wanted by the position of their teacup um, and Carmen described her coffee lounge as the savory was downstairs, but the sweets were all upstairs. Which is my favorite quote. So Carmen did heaps of cool and outrageous and political things, and I could go on and on. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about one thing, and that's Carmen's mayoralty run. 
1977, she decided to run for mayor of Wellington, which was this huge deal because up until then, all the mayoral candidates had pretty much all been old, boring white dudes, no offense. Um, and suddenly here's this glamorous queen arriving to election debates in a limousine, and she pulled all sorts of outrageous attention-grabbing stunts, uh, like publishing Carmen's thoughts for the day in major newspapers, where she attributed quotes by Plato and Aristotle to herself. Um, getting a flash mob of strippers to stop rush hour traffic down by the Basin Reserve, and using the cheeky campaign slogan, Get In Behind, which is a reference to anal sex. <laughs> One of her classic quotes from the election campaign is when Carmen said at an election forum up at Vic Uni, I am easily the best candidate. I am better looking than Sir Francis Kitts. I am more charming than Michael Fowler, and I could beat Tony Brunton a brawl any day. Because of the humor that Carmen used to grab attention, a campaign is often dismissed as nothing more than a joke. But I think that Carmen had a lot of political agency that goes unrecognized. Humor was a really effective tool. Before then, no other local government election had had packed out debate halls. And I'm so interested in this photo of her um, during an election meeting in 1977. Uh, where, you know, given her usual looks, this to me seems Carmen at her most demure. Can everyone see that? Yeah. So the political system tried to chew her up. This was a woman who struggled with reading and literacy, but she was someone with a big heart and a long vision. Listening to Carmen talk about her ideas, and there's some really great um, interviews with her from radio uh, back in the early 70s, reveals a person who was genuinely, uh, genuinely believed in what she stood for. While the Truth newspaper titled their article about her campaign, Ruffles for Capital, mm -hmm. focusing on the most salacious in order to draw readers, mm -hmm. um, Carmen explained clearly in that article that she felt that legalizing brothels would help reduce the growing number of rapes and attacks on women, mm -hmm. and that requiring regular medical checks would make sex work safer, safer, which is something that we recognize these days with the passing of the Prostitution Law Reform Act in 2003. So Carmen was decades before her time. She ran on the promise of radical social change, uh, proposing the decriminalization of abortion, prostitution, and homosexuality, all of which she had vocalized support for well before 1977. And this isn't to say that Carmen's humor wasn't important or significant or political in its own right, or that something has to be political for it to be important, but rather that the continued dismissal of Carmen and Queens in general as merely humorous figures who had little to contribute to the liberation movement is a purposely transphobic interpretation of our history that has erased some of our most important ancestors. And so that's the most important thing that I think I uh, wanted to get across about Carmen today. Um, and then if we move forward, well, further out of Wellington City a little bit, I want to show you this curious newspaper article that um, I found in a, a scrapbook compiled by gay liberation activist Ellen Duff in the early 1970s. Uh, the title is Robbery for Sex Change. So in 1974, a group of armed youths tried to rob a uh, bank in Lower Hutt, uh, in order to pay for their friend's gender affirmation surgery, at the time it's being called sex change surgery, um, which I think is so fantastic. No one did that for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I really think this is the standard trans allies need to aspire to. <laughs> um, I don't know an awful lot beyond that, but I do know um, that someone did a similar thing um, in the United States two years prior. He robbed a bank in order to pay for his girlfriend's um, affirmation surgery, and so I do wonder that they were uh, probably inspired by that. And then a year later, in 1975, Dog Day Afternoon, um, a film about that incident um, of bank robbery uh, was made. So they did it before the movie, which is pretty cool. Um, also in Lower Hutt, which seems to have been a bit of a hub for trans activity, which I only realized uh, when I was listening to someone else talk, because uh, both the bank robbery, um, and then there were several trans groups that were founded in Lower Hutt. Uh, it was home to Hedespia, which is the first recorded trans organization in New Zealand. It was founded in 1972 uh, by Christine Young, a transvestite, and it was primarily a social group for trans people um, where they could come together and socialize out of the cisgender eye, wearing whatever clothes they felt comfortable in and being able to discuss whatever they wanted. At meetings, they would discuss everything from how to come out, to make up bra fillers, whether or not sexuality had anything to do with gender and all the theories on that, to the politics of using the bathroom. And this is happening way back in the 1970s, so these conversations are really old, even though some people in the media like to treat them as pretty new. So, um, Anestia's leaders really understood the importance of providing support to trans people and connecting them up to one another. 
Alongside their meetings, they published a newsletter called Transcribe, which is a really great name, uh, in order to connect people who lived in more isolated areas, allowing members to share their stories, their tips, um, and to connect with each other. One thing that the group's newsletter constantly stressed was the importance of cultivating trans friendships in order to combat what they called isolation syndrome. There are so many letters from members writing in to transcribe to say how important this year was for them. Um, just one of many quotes. Where would I be today if I never joined Hedestia? Probably in a mental hospital, in a cemetery, or at best perhaps an alcoholic, which shows quite bluntly um, how Wendy, how much uh, Wendy was helped by the group. All right, next slide, please. And to go a little bit further out of Wellington, um, we, I'm going to talk a little bit about Georgina Bayer. So Georgina Bayer was actually born in Hatay, well, in Wellington. She was. Uh, spent the first few years of her life in Hatay Thai. She moved all around the country, but spent a lot of her a lot of her life in Wellington. Um, she kind of had moved out of Wellington, and then came back again in 1976. And it was in 1976 that she first encountered Queens for the first time at Carmen's balcony. She said, "I was totally blown away. It was the first time that I had ever clapped eyes on transgender people that I'd ever come across that culture of gay life. I really didn't know it existed beforehand." And so naturally, it was as if I had arrived home. It was as if I had seen the light, that it was possible to be a woman. Georgina worked as a sex worker and a performer for many years in Wellington, um, but her major passion was acting. Uh, her first major role was in a film by well-known gay director and pioneer of queer cinema, Peter Wells, in a film called Jules Dahl. Um, <laughs> um, it, uh, she played the uh, lead role of Jewel, who was a queen who was in a relationship with a transvestite named Mandy, and that's her photo up there. And it was a really outstanding film because it didn't rely on any stereotypes of trans people. Instead, it really tried to show people um, not as caricatures, but as people with real lives. It shows them with a lot of humanity. Um, it showcases their relationship in lots of sweet ways. They start off the film with them sharing tea and biscuits in bed. Uh, and Jewel teaches the new queen on the scene, Mandy, how to survive in a trans misogynistic world. Despite originally being censored, eventually the short film was, scre was screened, and Georgina received a nomination for the Listener Gofker Award for Best Actress in 1987, which in itself was a big thing because she was a trans woman being um, put up for an award for Best Actress, and no one made too much of a fuss about it apart from apparently one of the other nominees. Um, the story might have been a little different if she had won, um, but, she, but unfortunately she didn't, um, so we won't know. But the film is really, like, really, really, really cool, and you should definitely watch it. You can watch it online on NZ On Screen, the full thing's um, available up there. It's really a showcase of trans pride. Georgina laughs in the face of jeering men, keeps her head held high amongst glaring crowds. She playfully mocks the marching Salvation Army and the homophobic member of parliament, Norman Jones, <laughs> and imparts this wisdom onto Mandy. You've got to be tough, kid. You've got to never lose face. However, after this role, she struggled to find roles that um, didn't typecast her as stereotypes of what trans people thought cis people were. And because she was struggling with acting, she then decided to move on to Carterton. Uh, her first job in Carterton was working at the Carterton Council teaching acting classes. And from there, she kind of worked her way up the organization. Um, and then, if you go to the next slide, um, she got to the position where she became most famous to everyone, which is she was eventually, in 1995, uh, elected as mayor of Carterton, which made her the first out trans person in the world to be elected to the position of mayor. Um, and then four years later, she was elected member of um, parliament for Wairarapa, which was the first out trans person to ever be elected to a position in parliament. So, yeah, that's where I'm going to end my talk. Um, technically, it's still a history of Wellington with the Carterton stuff because I found out it's part of the Greater Wellington region. I didn't know. But, <laughs> that's yeah, that's my potted history. Thank you for listening. Roger. So um, as I said, Roger uh, worked many years as a librarian 
Um, now retired, but he's still a very active member of um, the GANS, and so that's the Organic Day Archive in New Zealand. So we've got lots of members of that here today, which is an amazing, um, amazing resource that we have. Um, fantastic. Um, Roger's been involved in that for um, a very long time, um, and so started as a volunteer in the 90s, is that right? Yeah. The 80s, 90s, um, and is now the secretary to the board of trustees for the GANS. Um, he's lived in Ponegui most of his life and has seen a lot of change and a lot of the um, stuff that we now get to learn about um, through the archive that actually happened in real time. So lots of things to impart on us. So, to you. Thank you very much for that. Pure everybody, and happy pride. Um, it's very nice to speak to you. Um, so I'll talk, I'm going to talk about the archive, and the archive has been around 40-something years now in Wellington, so it is a Wellington institution um, with the, nat uh, the national reach. So, um, so I'll talk about some of the Wellington stuff, but certainly um, we, the archive, we started off in a basement in Bullcock Street, um, <laughs> with a smelly, rather dank, damp, dank basement there, just off the of the Angels, there was a community centre there, where all sorts of groups, lesbian groups, gay groups, uh, community, other communities there. So, um, and now we're in the luxury of the Alexander Temple Library, so we've sort of moved up with accommodation. Um, so there's, there's basically the talk. Um, <laughs> archives are a charitable trust, um, we house the Alcon Temple Library, um, we collect, preserve and make available um, the research records and, and personal papers of the alphabet and people of the organisation of New Zealand and by that, that's from our constitution where we, uh, which was done 10 years ago, so it's probably dated now, um, we need to update that. Um, but basically we are looking at the lives of uh, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, kapapu, Papa, Tui, Papafini, intersex or queer, um, same sex attraction, trans and intersex members, and the indigenous community of the Pacific. Not a small um, area at all to have to collect in and to um, look at. Um, so, if we do the next one, um, so I thought about collect. Well, we collect everything um, relating to those lives um, and in all formats and all sorts of media. Um, so, there's the replay list. And it keeps growing, and I keep forgetting to put an oral history, and I keep putting in um, various other bits and pieces. Um, so we have a great we have a box of t-shirts, we have um, heaps of buttons, we have heaps of um, books, magazines. Um, digital stuff is really becoming, is, is the issue we're trying to face now. Um, we have all the challenges of any library, like the City Library here has all these challenges. Well, we're a small archive in comparison, but we still have the same um, challenges, and we need to work to do that um, and it's all done by volunteers so none of us are paid um, so we're a volunteer organization so collect um, this is a, 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 a sort of history of, of the archive um, it started out with the NGRC I think it became the NLGRC the name funny remember it's really nice gay men and women was an appropriate phrase phrase to use um, so it became a uh, gay and lesbian um, resource centre um, or um, selective and so the first news was that top one and then it became Pink Triangle um, and Pink Triangle was a really an, a, a publication of record it recorded the 80s and the 90s really of what was happening around New Zealand and in Wellington um, and what was happening in the LGBT community um, and it changed format it went along and ended up as sort of a glossy magazine from the newspaper and uh, finished about um, 1992, somewhere around that um, But the archive, which started off as a resource centre, uh, provided information to the Pink Triangle. And the Pink Triangle or Rotten magazine and books from overseas, because there were no, no New Zealand stuff at that stage. And they, um, and so they sort of fed on one another and the archive looked after the material that came through. Um, so some of the areas that randomly did a bit of New Zealand Wellington um, items. Um, the, the heart of the archive is the manuscript collection, which are the unique, unique records of the LGBT community in Wellington and throughout the country. And um, we have, I think we're at about 780 
of these collections now. And some of the collections are just one folder, and others are 10, 15 boxes of material. Um, so it depends on the organisation, how long it existed, and what survived. Um, organisations that took minutes and were very efficient at that sort of thing tend to have lots of material. Those that um, didn't have very slim pickings and just the old brochure and maybe a newsletter. Um, so this group, the Adorian Society, was the first social club for gay men, and they had a, a group that formed to do um, law reform. So they were, sort of, they were social, but there was a group interested in changing the law, and this was in the 1960s. So it was really good. Um, the, uh, what else, pink ranks that I've mentioned. Um, Homosexual Law Reform Society um, existed from the 60s and worked to change law. They were quite a conservative group, and they wanted people, they were trying to influence members of parliament and others in the community to support law reform. Um, that, rather than um, a revolutionary sort of thing, they sort of wanted people to be, they were being nice, and it would be nice to them with that sort of thing. They did a lot of work, though, so um, they formed a lot of changing public opinion and things like that was their area. Um, the Pena Centre um, was a key centre for AIDS in um, Wellington um, and lived up by, was located just up by the hospital there. Um, and uh, Leo, Leonie Neal was a, a well-known Wellingtonian um, for many years advocating um, trans issues. Um, she was quite controversial at times, um, but um, she was a character. So. <laughs> um, um, Photographs, David Henley's collection, the large collection we have. It's part of the triangle collection uh, of photographs, which is which is huge. Um, and has iconic photos like this is the celebration after law reform at the town hall. Um, so we've got lots of David's images. And if you go to Pride NZ, there's a collection of them there, which are really nice. So if I pick that one off. Um, so just to give some idea of the size, that's good at two rows of, of magazines, serials, um, newsletters. And a lot of the newsletters we collect, uh, we're the only people who have them. Libraries are interested in LGBT organisations and their newsletters, so they don't exist anywhere else. Um, it's of magazines. We have New Zealand and overseas. A lot of people, when you know, people travel overseas to Sydney or to New York or wherever, they often brought back magazines with them, and then they've ended up at the archives. So a lot of sample copies of New York native and things like that, um, we have in the collection. And funny enough, I've got somebody who wanted to look at all those recently, uh, doing a uh, looking at Australia, American communities and how, how community organisations work in America. So they will be quite useful for that. Um, next, um, book collection, we've about four rows looking like that. That's about uh, six to 7,000 books. Um, again, most of those are donated, come from people's collections, um, cover all topics. Um, but we've also got a large gift from the AIDS Foundation and they um, dispensed with the information centre in Auckland um, through budget cuts. So we got those pickings of it and about a thousand box came down to us and one of the other Davis collections. Shame it's not in Auckland, but um, and we don't have a catalogue except on the expression. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so there are large size serials, newspapers. Beautiful little Turnbull Library, up optimum conditions for storage. Um, so we're very fortunate to have that with our folders and things. Um, this is why we're at the Turnbull. Um, in 1986, it was the resource centre was in Fox Street on the first floor, I think. And um, during the evening, someone, I don't think they broke and they just walked in. I think the building security wasn't very good. Um, followed somebody in, and they discovered this the archive. Um, so they sent the light to a couple of guys, um, wrote a bag on the floor, so it was sort of a little bit of um, hate involved and homophobia. Um, but fortunately, the fire brigade came very quickly. Other people in the building, in the building alerted. And so the fire brigade put, when they saw it was a library, they put the um, tarpaulins over this on the shoulder and protected oh, wow. from water damage, etc. But um, not about 5% of the collection, that was material out sitting up being used or being worked on. And uh, steel cabinets protected the camp collection. And the shelving was remarkable, even the open shelving, like around here, was remarkably good for protecting the books. They got singed, and so we have lovely singed collections. 
which, and we have a box that has remnants of stuff that we bring out occasionally and get to look at. Um, so we survived. Um, but the Turnbull Library came to the rescue, which is what Turnbull Library does when there's a flood or a fire for an institution like ours. And so the, the collection was put in boxes for a couple of years, down at Pontius Place, and looked after by the Turnbull Library, sorted things out. And then we negotiated with the Turnbull storage. And um, so we moved the archive to the Library. Um, they provided safe storage, they provided reading rooms. Um, hours when people can come in to look at the collection and they start a certain amount of time for staff to provide um, services. So that was um, really good. And so we've gone to safe harbour really um, for the collection and since that, since 1988, I think, the agreement, first agreement was signed and the agreement's been renewed a number of times since then. Um, so preservation, um, the top lot shows, we, they don't provide us with folders. I tend to pull in them when they're free. Um, <laughs> uh, they're very expensive to acid-free folders. The top lot's got acid-free folders. The bottom, um, the Express Magazine, now has folders. <laughs> so um, gradually, um, the collection is... But we tend to focus on the New Zealand stuff and not the overseas stuff as our high priority, because that's the unique stuff. So we've a couple of years, a couple of, sorry, two runs of the Express Magazine from whenever it started. That's what our manuscript collection looks like. We've got five rows looking like that. And those wax boxes, and inside each of those boxes are folders, basically folders with material. And like I said, it can be one folder for some group or 100 folders. So it just depends on group. Access. Um, our main, one of our main access points is the website, and it's all too small to see there, but um, it's, it's now being refreshed somewhat. Um, and we have lists on there for the magazines and for the manuscript papers, uh, plus um, audio for the homosexual law reform period. Um, so there's some good and some very good information there. And um, there on the next one. Uh, this is another of our access points. Access points. We have a research guy that Will wrote as, as an intern at National Library um, on behalf of Lagans and on behalf of the Turnbull Library. Um, and so, guide you through both the Turnbull Library collection and the Lagans collections of the LGBT material here. Next. Um, we also, since we stopped logging people on cards, we now uh, have been in cards doing the National Library catalogue, so there are, I think, because I said 1,400 items on there that have been catalogued and available. Um, the first one's the Friends of News, which are Friends of the Lagans, so that's their newsletters. The next one is the Archive is Alive, which you just heard about, um, and as well as latest action, and there it is there, um, front page. And that's another way of accessing the collection by publications. And so over the years, we've had lots of researchers in writing about the collection, or using material from the collections for their publications. So um, best mates, um, um, what's on earth? Prickles. Prickles, that's right. Mates um, and yes, yes, so uh, mates and lovers. There's a lot of material for that. Um, we run on um, soldiers at the moment. Um, bread food. Bread food, very good. So, you <laughs> said <laughs> <laughs> like that, so we're to remind you. Um, so, Brett, so he, he drew on the collection as well. So, it's just lots of people over the years have drew, have used the collection. We've got someone there writing on really law reform moves back in the 60s and 70s at the moment. And they're pouring through the Homosexual Law Reform Society, Dorian Society papers, and various other, and picking up people who were in those and hunting them down to interview them. So it's quite, you know, quite an interesting <laughs> doing it. Um, whoops, what happened there? Something went. Whoops, back one. Um, also something on the slide, didn't mind. Um, so, so our access, actually, this, uh, uh, right, okay, that's a sort of, Future that has gone. What's <laughs> happening? So, so we've got so far, and we are looking at how to provide a better service. People have to come to Wellington. They have to use a card index. They have to use the National Library catalogue. They use all sorts of bits, and we have lots of spreadsheets with lists of stuff on. Totally inadequate. Totally useless. Um, not really hard work. So we are looking forward to um, digitising. Make, or creating a digital system where the collection is managed online, so there's a public face, and then behind the scenes there's a, there's a management for the curators, 
Um, the, uh, so, so, and then we have digitized material like posters. We've got hundreds and hundreds of posters that would be really good to get out, out there online. Um, so we're going through that so far through the um, Rural Foundation and um, the Legacy Fund. We received a, a very healthy grant from them last year, and so it's enabled us to digitize our card catalog. So, 8,000 cards. It will scan. We are now with OCRing, which is optical recognition. We need to fix, to do some correction of that, so it picks up all sorts of dots and dashes and all bits and pieces. So there's a project going to happen very soon. We're going to seek volunteers to correct um, these these cards. And we did a project, a pilot of 700 cards from the posters, and a chap from America did them for us. When you go online, you never know quite know who's going to do the work. And I chat, and, and they were done within a week. It was really amazing. A few people, we didn't even get a chance to do it ourselves. So in the chat in America spent you know, several hours going through, removing bits and pieces, and dots and dashes, and, and punch holes in the card and things like that that cause marks on the on the record. And then, so, the, so that's been done. And so we're going to do the act now and fairly soon. We've got a group doing standards. Um, we want to face the whole collection of. Um, international standards for cataloging and for digitisation, so um, it's long term. And part of this is if I'm not going to be around forever, Linda's not going to be around, because the other curator, they're, they're, we're going to need to pass this collection on and the actors on, on to sort of a community that may not work at the Turnbull Library. Um, so it can be managed um, off site much more easier. People all over the country, over the world, can see the archive and can see what we have. Um, obtain copies, view material. So there's a whole, a whole world opening up there if we can get this done, um, uh, which would be really good. Um, so I think that's basically where we're at. Um, next one. Oh, we're out in the city. You should have been a bit under there saying, we're going to get out in the city. Come and see us. Um, so you'll be hidden up on the second floor, I believe, of Michael Power Centre. So hopefully people have been found. Um, but we're looking forward to that. Um, and that's going to be our... Oh, they don't have those other ones. That's some of our books. And this one is materials. Didn't read really long. And that's some of the more manuscripts. But um, Waxing Moon Collection. <coughs> group up in Hamilton. But, uh, anyway, so that's me. Um, a bit of a fast pace. So I shall leave you for next week. And um, has seen obviously a lot of the development <coughs> change in the city. Um, and for the last 15 years, has been a member of Tifana Fana, which is a Taku Taku community group based in Wellington. The Welcome people of all sorts of diverse sexualities and gender identities. Um, and they just had their 20th anniversary last Monday, I believe. So happy anniversary to them. Um, and I'm going to leave you in. Tina Koto Kato, call Kayla Ria and Shahu Inoa. You have to excuse me, sorry, I have not spoken Maori since birth, and it's 58 years. So if you can bear with me, please. Ko te ati awa, te iwi. Ko nasi tawhiri kura, te hape. Ko puni a rau ko... Parihaka aku marae, ko Taranaki te maunga, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou kato. Sorry. Te Whanawhana Trust was founded in 1998 by Elizabeth Kirikiri. Um, that was during the gay games in Amsterdam and it was from an idea given to her by her partner Alofa. Now that progress and her goals for uh, founding, founding Te Whana Whana were to provide a safe and fun place for Tukatakoi to live our culture in a way that would honour our diversity and to address issues for trans, intersex and gender non-conforming Tukatakoi. While adhering to the strict gendered roles of Māori protocols and performance, also to address the issue of racism by improving the use of tikanga 
within the rainbow community. From its inception, the Whanganga sought to model, its, uh, model the inclusivity embedded in the phrase Te Whanganga I He Kahikura I te rei, which means a rainbow is falling in the sky. Sorry, I'm not so asthmatic, so shortly. This translated as providing a foundation of Takatahui leadership or practices open to all rainbow people, their friends and farmers. Tupanakana <laughs> 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 extended its reach through the very uh, various community networks that it had established prior to the 2002 Gay Game in Sydney which they actually performed at, and eventually became an indigenous cultural presence at every rainbow event in the Wellington region. More importantly, the Whanakana modelled the use of tikkana and provided support at those events until others felt comfortable to apply that tikkana by themselves. Now this is the interesting part. 2004, saw the launch of Māori television on March 28th, including the program Takatāpui, or Takatāpui Presenters. It was the first free-to-air Indigenous queer program in the world. Also during 2004 was the infamous Destiny Church Leg March in both Akarana and Honake. What was both seen and experienced during that march in Funaki was evil and open hatred of other people. What was most offensive was their pontificating about what constitutes normal. <laughs> Destiny Church has effectively given license for bigots to express their hatred towards us. This march was the topic of much discussion for Tapanapana and it prompted Kim Hanoi, a founding member, to compose the Waiata Takatakoi Noa Aho. <coughs> Translation of this Waiata is as follows. It's in English. Okay. It's, look at me, a survivor for Rangiatia, a rock buffeted by the sea, a sentry, a learning harbour. A shark, stubborn and relentless, a fantail challenging your pathway, an echoing cliff, a deep string of tears, a speaker strong and clear like a bird, a singer of memories from a reef of kawaka. It comes, it appears, an illuminating rainbow. Don't overlook me just because I am Takatapui. Don't leave me behind, I am only Takatapui. Like a treasured moment to see the white heron or flying star. It comes, it appears, an illuminating star. Don't overlook me just because I am Takatapui. <coughs> Don't leave me behind, I am only Takatapui. Look at me, a survivor from Ramyatia. <sighs> That's good. <laughs> I was born in New Plymouth and I have lived my life in Wellington since birth. So what I've seen up there, I was making faces, I know all those people. <laughs> As in like the cup of tea, know them all. <laughs> so, and um, what Roger was explaining about the little arson at the um, archives, I was actually there. Right. Wow. Yeah. You weren't the arsonist though. <laughs> <laughs> no. But see, I, I lived in Wellington through that whole thing. Um, I was curious about gender, sexuality, and all that stuff on a young age because I come from a very big family, Maori family, and it's like I had to make my own way in the world. So when I ventured out, which was the Dorian Society of Wellington, mm -hmm. I made a promise to myself that I will do every single thing in our community so no one can dare look at me and say, you don't know what it's like. And I can say, yes I do. So I went, yes I did start off the gay aspect. Progress, progress, I've got children, biological children. 
Um, and I've gone to, I've gotten to a stage, I realised something was different. And it was what's inside of me. And so I come to realisation, which is common amongst all genders, all sexualities, regardless. It's the three key points. First, self-realisation. It's when you realise that you are slightly different. And then that progresses to second stage, self-acceptance. You've got to accept what, where and who you are. And then begins stage three, your transition. Um, that's a never-ending progress. I can stand here and say, I've done all of this, and it's transition. No, because each and every day that I live my life, or you live your lives, you're constantly transitioning to your next phase. In regards to outside of Tifangapana, I uh, do voluntary work with one city housing, and I am a community room coordinator and community events coordinator, Kaitiaki for a housing complex. And I use that vehicle to incorporate LGBT plus 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 communities. So I'm also a chef and a caterer. So it, as was mentioned, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary for Te Whanukana. So I catered for all of that and it was very good. <laughs> that was the other night, the day up Tuesday, this week, Tuesday this week. I had an influx of new foods for another catering job for 100 plus people in two days' time. And I had to write a speech for today, that's why I'm a little bit. <laughs> and then when I get home, I've got a defrost chicken and all that stuff. And I mean, I'm actually quite pleased that I've been noticed because of my talents and not because of who or what I am. So, in retrospect of the trends, I have seen and experienced first time the physical violence. Uh, but yeah, that all happened to us and my friends and our friends that come before us. Um, we're resilient. I'm still here. I'm pushing 60. And we looked at it as if that's a big atrocity that happened to us and to other members in, in all communities. But what we did as trans because I was a street by sex work at the time. We did not forget nor forgive. We busted down those damn barriers. Police. <coughs> Social, like working income, for example. All those government departments which plausible deniability of their little excuse why they can't do this and that. Mm -hmm. To make it into a shorter thing, we now have trans in the police force as first aid responders, as nurses, as doctors, and all of that, we have them as politicians. We have them as leaders of our community. I don't care, and they don't care if they're noticeable or not noticeable, they're living their life and they're showing the world and society their talent. So basically, it's your talent what you can do. Not how you look, not who you love. That's to, to me, it's that's totally irrelevant. I mean, I honestly find, I honestly find it's the ignorant people that will pick out who you love as a way to draw attention to themselves. It's like, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also like fully qualified as IT. In IT, um, and a lot fire warden, for example, I can do that, and building warden and stuff like that. But it's the stigma you get from various people. For example, there was a gentleman by the name of Jack Byrne, who went for the um, who was senior policy analyst with the Human Rights Commission. He was a trans man, lucky guy. We did work through a series of hoys with the um, Human Rights Commission, and it was past that we can change 
our markers on our passports. That was really great. I was one of the first to have a female put on my passport. So my nephew decided to show me a trip to America. Brilliant. Got on the plane, fine. Everything, fine. I even stayed in Harlem. <laughs> yeah, Harlem. But it was coming back. I went to New York Airport. And because they had the Homeland Security, eight soldiers, fully armed rifles, one lady standing there scanning. She made me go through a scanner five times. And because they make them, they have a little screen on the outside. You can see it. So I come around, I turn a little like this. She said, Oh, you got something on your back? I said, Yeah, it's off. I'm holding up my tits. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to take it off? But that was intimidating, it was terrorising because you had armed guards ready. And I was like, No. But the thing is, I'm still going back there because I made friends over there. I went to Stonewall to find out the true history. And lo and behold, it was the trans woman that threw a brick that started the process for the whole gay, lesbian revolution. Now that is something to look back on. The people these days, the younger generation these days, I found, tend to be a little bit self-entitled. <laughs> what they don't, don't have or need to realise is it's people from the older generation that come before it. They have done things in their life that add to the easement of their life. It's like you're born, you're this, you're that. It's, oh, we're going to fight for this. That's already been done. We're going to, that's already been done too. The whole thing is, it's not who you are, okay? It's what you can do. How you contribute. If you want to promote um, your specific community in regards to your rights, that's a bonus because it adds to the unified voice. We've got um, the, the founder for Te Whana Whana. When she founded it, her name was Elizabeth Kerakiri. Sorry, she is now a politician. Dr. Elizabeth Kerakiri, Green MP. I went to her uh, maiden speech in Parliament, which was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and this is another instance where there's that little bit of discrimination and, oh, look at me, I can make that person look ashamed. And it was by one of the ushers who told me to go through one door right at the end, which I did, and everyone else went to the other side. I think I'll read, so I was sitting there. The Green, oh no, the party was speaking, and I looked, and they were all sitting there in suits. Then I was getting sign language from the gallery. What am I doing sitting with them? So, I was supposed to be over with the group. So, with the Michelle went to leave, I went to walk out, and then I was with Kitty Kitty's partner, and family come this way. So I got stuck there again. <laughs> and next month I'm getting sign language from Dr. Elizabeth Kitty Kitty on the floor of Parliament House, going like this. I thought I was in deaf school learning again. And it was like, so I had to try and explain to her, no, they did this to me. But to me, it just went right over my head. <sighs> I'm sorry if I've been talking too long, but uh, get back to the point of things. All of those people that were seen up here in uh, Will's speech before, I do know them all personally. They've had a far harder life than anyone in this room, including myself. As in the violence, I mean, today we, I can walk up the street and People will say, under the breath, oh, you want to pose, you can't remember. Who cares? But years ago, it was the physical objects, the hate, the spitting, the guns, the trash, and bottles that were thrown at us, um, especially being a street sex worker. But it's like, we endure it. 
but now it's like, well, we actually did a service for Sati. We took away potential neighbours, <coughs> wife, wife beaters. We gave them a space where they could come, blah, blah. Your money was exchanged, but we did them a service sort of thing. We listened to them. And by doing that, we stopped at least one person from going home to bash your partner. We stopped one person from walking up the street bashing their girlfriend. We were staunch, we were resilient, and we still are. But, I mean, what I want to express to everyone is, regardless of what faction or community you belong to, there should be absolutely no separation when it comes to the collective community. Because, I mean, we're celebrating Pride Festival. That means pride in yourself, pride of who you are. Last year's Pride Parade, they had a quiet protest against police. I was in that parade, and I was like, no, those young cadets were trans, intersex, blah, blah, the whole spectrum. The senior officers were there as part of protocol procedure to watch over them. So no incidents, and they were also there to protect the community, which is really good. So this year, I've um, done a few events already for Pride, Pride event, Pride festival, and then I'm going to go and do some more for um, International Pride Parade. I think I spoke in my life, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was nervous as hell, and I was just like, slightly dedicated because I had, had an injury, but I'm trying to get a point across to everyone. When you walk down the street, you just go where you're going. You want to go from point A to point B, that's where you go. Whoever walks past says whatever, they don't matter. They're usually insecure, <laughs> attention seeking. People that want to draw attention to them because they're bullying us. We're the bigger bullies because the actions we take, the achievements we've done, mm -hmm. it's like, well, you can't do this. You just go, well, you can't do this. We can do this and shut you out. Take a good look at, through there in the archives and see what achievements we've done mm -hmm. as a collector. It's like we've stood up and said, no, and then what happened? We change it always. Gradually, but we've done it. So, and from here on, it's just pure progress. And after that, enjoy your life. Kia ora. Kia ora. And for the last 20 years has been active as a consultant working in education and training. Um, and Manny has lectured and run workshops all around the world and set up the Intersex Trust Aotearoa New Zealand, which is now the world's oldest, uh, longest running intersex organisation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to completely change what I was going to say, partly because I'm aware of time, and also I want to refocus the session. So, the Intersex Trust was started here in Whanganui, Atara, in 19, well, 1997. We started it, but in 1996, I went to America. So, I found out there was an intersex retreat. Now, it's really hard to understand in that period of time I'd never met any other intersex people and my whole notion of what an intersex person was, like lots of people of my generation, came out of a medical textbook, which is a very strange and weird way of starting to make sense of who you are and what other people in your peer group might look like. So I went to America, I was the only person representing the world there were nine Americans and me. 
And it was an amazing um, gathering of people. We went to California, we spent a weekend together, and I came back and decided that we needed an organi a similar organization here in New Zealand. So there's some wonderful links from what we've been talking about today, is the group of people. And in and, and that era, I'd come out as an anesthetic person. I couldn't really understand what that was. But my foundation was coming out in Whanganui, and I came out um, with gay men, and it was in the era prior to homosexual law reform. So that, that's my foundation. That was where I came from. Came down here to Wellington. I'd grown up in the country, but if, if you are a country person and you need to live in a city, like many of us do for safety reasons, then this was a safe place to do that. So I came down, set up the organisation. Um, we did the opening at Victoria University. One of the things about me, I had my dad's silly sense of humour. So the reason I did that is the current boardroom at the university used to be the old medical school library. And I thought, what a wonderful way to sign up, to stand in that room and go, fuck you, all the doctors. <laughs> The first building that we had was just up the road in the Harcourts building and I was explaining to someone that building was empty for nearly eight years. The man that owned it um, let not-for-profit organisations use that building for free. So that, that's how we started in New Zealand and, and here in, in Wellington. The original trust board, it was only me as the only intersex person. Um, so we've gone from there to where ITANS is today, where we have um, other intersex people on the board, we have other visible people in the community, and when we get to questions we can talk about that. The other amazing thing that we did um, two years ago, the World Ilga Intersex Conference, we had 76 intersex people from around the world. I never thought that that would be possible to have that many people here in, in my city. Um, very proud of what we did that year. That was the year that we had the rainbow painted at the end of the, the airport. So, you know, that, that's a very fast. Will and I are working together at the moment to record the history of ITANS. And I'm hoping that that will end up in Megan, so that information <laughs> will be available for everyone. So that's a very fast journey through um, ITANS and its history. Thank you. All right, so uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers. It's been really informative and really fun and great to hear everybody's stories. Um, so we now have questions. Is that right? Everybody happy to stay for questions? Yeah. So over to the floor, um, if anybody has any questions, just uh, pop your hand up and let me know and then I'll get some to come up. So have you got any questions for anyone? <laughs> Uh, Legans is funded by volunteer, by voluntary contribution. Um, the only we we came to get grants, and we've had a couple of grants over the years uh, for different projects like oral history and things like that. Um, but the Rural Foundation, the Legacy Fund, we we received our first really substantial bit of funding. The rest is through friends. So you can do it with a friend, and, and that's twenty dollars. Um, or we have a give a little page. You're very welcome to throw twenty bucks on the give a little page. It'll <laughs> help with our storage. We're paying for storage at the moment. Um, and we want to pay more. And we want to pay for digital storage as well. That's our one of the, one of the part of the project is to get digital storage. So give a little land or, or rainbow history. Yeah. As an archivist, I can tell you, it's incredibly expensive to get all the materials to keep that stuff safe mm. um, and the work that's done. So if you can throw a little bit of money that way. It's pretty much, I mean, aside from oral history, is one of the only ways that we're going to preserve all of this history. So it's super important that we do support them. I just want to, um, it's actually true that we have at Leggins. So a lot of the ITANS history was out at stored at um, Kilburnie, mm -hmm. not lost mm -hmm. in the Kilburnie fire. Yeah. As I think other really, really precious. Um, and while dark life disappeared. 
talk to anyone who's now supposed to come to us. I'll just remember your book. We do have some Fred Wild samples, though. Yeah. We've got before the fire, you know, offloaded at various stages. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot to be said for funding that sort of thing. And not just it's paper, but now we're into the digital era as well. And how do we preserve the digital history, knowledge of the LGBT community, um, book in Edge Library, um, archives, websites, and I was constantly recommending LGBT websites so that they can archive them and keep them forever and be available. But um, we do need to be in that space as well. So I might say, donate your stuff to us as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, your old queer history in the making, your lives are important, your archives are important. So we want your stuff as well. Email Roger. He'll deal with it. Thank you so much for coming. It's been really wonderful to see all of you. It's been such a great turnout. And if we could just have a round of applause again for us.